good evening. Welcome, um, John, the event director at Literati Bookstore. Um, we're pleased to welcome Stefan Szymanski, Silke Maria Weinek, and support of their new book, City of Champions. And they'll be in conversation this evening with a fellow professor, the University of Michigan historian, Stephen Ward. Some housekeeping, the chat is closed, as I mentioned, as you were connecting, but you may wanna keep the chat window open during the events, because I'll be dropping links to purchase the book uh, from Literati, and uh, there will be a link in the description as well um, if you're watching later on YouTube. Um, you can submit questions for a Q&A at any time. You can use the Q&A feature that's available to you on the webinar to do so. And I will read a selection of those conversations, time permitting, at the conclusion of the conversation. But whenever you feel compelled to ask a question, please feel free to submit it using the Q&A anytime during the event. As a reminder, you can check for more books at literatibookstore.com. Thousands of titles are also uh, available for curbside pickup if you are joining us from Southeast Michigan, Ann Arbor area, which I suspect many of you are. And in lieu of a book purchase, uh, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our events, you can make a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on uh, where and when in the world you might be joining us from. So without further ado, I'll introduce the authors of City of Champions and our moderator this evening, Stefan Szymanski is co-author of Soccernomics. Uh, he's a sports economist who teaches sport management at the University of Michigan. And he is the co-author of City of Champions, A History of Triumph and Defeat in Detroit. He lives in Ann Arbor. And Silke Maria Weinick, author of The Tragedy of Fatherhood, is a professor of comparative literature at the University of Michigan. And our moderator this evening is Stephen Ward. He's a historian who teaches at the University of Michigan in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies and the Residential College. He is the faculty director of the University of Michigan's Semester in Detroit program, board member of the James and Grace Lee Boggs Center to Nurture Community Leadership in Detroit, and the author of In Love and Struggle, The Revolutionary Lives of James and Grace Lee Boggs. They won't be able to hear you, but they will be able to recognize your support. So please clap at home and join me in welcoming Silka, Stefan, and Stephen to your living rooms and take it away. Thank you very much, John. And thank you, Silka and Stefan, for occasioning this conversation. And thank you all who are there joining us for this conversation about this exciting and creative and, and generative new book. We are, of course, having this conversation in the virtual space, but it is, it is a conversation about a specific uh, place, an impactful place, uh, over a, a range of time and, and several important uh, and exciting moments. And so this conversation will allow us to learn about how Silka and Stefan put together this, this work and what they're saying about this place, Detroit. And it's a place which we all uh, know is important in many ways, also vilified and examined quite a bit. Their book adds to this uh, with a, a unique and again, exciting and creative examination. So I'm looking forward to jumping into the conversation. I'll also add that their book also in a couple of ways um, adds to and extends from a, a longstanding and sometimes fraught relationship between the city, city of Detroit and the University of Michigan. So the three of us as uh, members of the faculty of the University of Michigan recognize and uh, appreciate the opportunity, opportunity to examine and explore that relationship. And we look forward to your questions to help us to do that. We're gonna begin with uh, a few readings of passages of the book. And to get us started, Silka is going to begin. I should know by now to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read just a few paragraphs from the introduction, and then I'll hand over to Stefan for uh, one of the stories we're telling in this book. So the Paris of New France, then the Motor City, the Arsenal of Democracy, later Motown, New Fallujah, the murder capital, the comeback city. Detroit has gone by so many names since its founder declared in the early 18th century that, quote, all nations will come to settle there. They did. 
And they built what we believe is the most American of American cities, embodying the country's glory and agony alike. This book is about Detroit as a city of champions and its many triumphs and defeats, athletic and otherwise. Sports have a unique power to unify those who have nothing in common. They're, they're the last mass ritual in a fractured world. Athletic events mark city life and city time. By now, they're the only venues in which a city routinely expresses itself as a city. The Tigers, Lions, Red Wings, Pistons belong to Detroit more so than they belong to their owners. And it is not by chance that Joe Lewis's fist has become the most recognizable symbol of the city, eclipsing that giant monument known as the Spirit of Detroit. Sports are and have always been a site of struggles that exceed them. The fact that they bring together people who would otherwise have nothing to say to each other does not mean they erase the fault lines that run through American public life. No matter how loudly major league owners clamor for political neutrality, which is just a particular kind of politics anyways, we know sports are about race, about money, gender, infrastructure, violence, aesthetics, class, history, identity, and so on. Sometimes you can forget about that during the game or the fight or the race, but it always comes back. In a city's Olympic bids and the global political forces that doom them, in the anti-Semitic jeers hurled at Hank Greenberg, in Joe Lewis's fight against Hitler's favorite boxer, in a city budget that can't find money for a stadium, but not for heated classrooms, in a women's baseball league that forces its players to wear makeup and slide into base wearing miniskirts. These are some teasers of the many stories we're telling this book. And now over to Stefan for one of them. Thank you, Zuka. Um, so I'm gonna read from extracts from chapter four. Each chapter in the book deals with a specific sporting event as a pivot around which we can talk about what was happening in the city more broadly. And this event took place on November the 19th, 2004. A foul, a shove, a scuffle, an athlete lies down, a drink flies through the air, and the NBA would never be the same again. What happened? An eyewitness recalls the scene as a series of unfortunate events. Quote, if Ron Artest doesn't make that hard foul on Ben Wallace, it doesn't happen. If Ben Wallace doesn't react the way he did, it doesn't happen. If the referees control the situation, it doesn't happen. If Artes doesn't go lie down on the scorer's table, it doesn't happen. If the fan doesn't throw the beverage, it doesn't happen. You take away any one of them and the whole thing doesn't happen, end quote. But it did happen and the reactions came in fast and furious. David Stern, who had been NBA commissioner at the time would later recall the malice at the palace as these events would come to be known as the biggest crisis of his career. He placed much of the blame on the media for reacting with rehearsed outrage. Quote, the brawl provided much of the media in the course of that weekend to use the word thugs and punks with respect to all of our players, which to me is freighted with respect to what they're really saying and brought up visions of the way the media treated us a decade or more earlier, end quote. Was he saying the racist, the coverage was racist? Quote, yeah, mildly, let's say, end quote. Of course, he himself had called the events of the game shocking, repulsive, and inexcusable, a humiliation for everyone associated with the NBA. The brawl involving the Indiana Pacers, the Detroit Pistons, and a number of Pistons fans had a history. I'm gonna skip the history here, which uh, you can get in full from the book, but I want to focus on the event itself. That night, the Pacers were determined to prove themselves the better team, and they took a scorched earth approach. Having overwhelmed the Pistons, they led 97 to 82 with 45.9 seconds left in the game. If your opponent's defeat is guaranteed, you're generally expected to ease up, play out time and coach for the win. But that night, the Pacers decided that, decide they have a point to prove. After an Indiana free throw, the Pistons bring the ball up court and pass it to center Ben Wallace in the paint. As Wallace goes up for the shot, Ron Artest smacks him on the head from behind. Wallace retaliates by shoving Artest and a slew of players come off the bench to stave off a full-blown brawl. Between security staff and players from both teams holding on to the two men, much of the action is purely performative at this point, 
more vigorous taunting than actual scuffle and not terribly unusual. But just as things start to settle down, Artest climbs on top of the scorer's table and lies down. This curious gesture proves to be the match that lights the tinder. The scorer's table and the chairs that surround the court form an effective barrier between the players and the fans that is meant to be sacrosanct. And now Artest is on his back in no man's land. Maybe it's nothing more than an innocent attempt to calm himself down. And maybe it is intended to promote. But given the volatile atmosphere inside the arena and with the benefit of hindsight, it is not surprising that at least one Pistons fan sees the enemy prone and decides he's a target impossible to resist. A plastic cup of Diet Coke, or perhaps beer, as competing accounts claim, flies through the air and hits Artest on the chest. In a split second, Artest leaps up into the stands and starts in on the fan. The wrong one, it turns out, though it hardly makes a difference at this point. It's quickly becoming a general brawl. Some fans recoil in dismay, but plenty of others are eager to join in and more players run into the stands in support of their men, places as well as at least one piston, Ben Wallace himself. Punches fly and connect. Holy shit, David Stern, who is watching on TV, exclaims. About 10 minutes, after about 10 minutes, it is over and they manage to stop the fighting, but getting the paces off the court into the safety of their locker room and out of the stadium is a bit of a challenge given the ire of the Pistons fans who rain drinks and objects on them from the stands. Later, Pacer Stephen Jackson will remember that Artest turned to him in the locker room. Artest looked at me. Jack, you think we're going to get in trouble? Jamal Tinsley fell about laughing. I said, are you serious, bro? Trouble? Ron, we'll be lucky if we have a freaking job. But even before they are hustled out of the arena, much of the country has already decided who was to blame. John Saunders of ESPN calls the Detroit fans a bunch of punks and says, quote, I don't blame the players for going into the stands. Comedian Bill Burr will declare that later that he thoroughly enjoyed watching, quote, out of shape civilians get the shit kicked out of them by professional athletes, end quote. Tim Legler, a former NBA player, echoes the sentiment, quote, the blame should be put on the Detroit Pistons fans, end quote. But the league and the justice system take a more even-handed approach. The NBA comes down hard on both teams, but harder on the paces. They suspend our test for the remainder of the season, the harshest penalty for an on-court violation in the history of the NBA, which will cost him five million in salary. Ben Wallace is suspended for six games, costing him 400,000 in salary. Four more paces and three more Pistons players receive suspensions of various varying lengths. On December 8th, Oakland County prosecutors charged five Indian, Indiana players, Artest, O'Neill, Jackson, Harrison, and Johnson, and five fans, John Green, William Paulson, Brian Jackson, Don Ackerman, and David Wallace, with assault and battery. Months of legal haggling follow. The players eventually plead no contest, and only Green ended up serving jail time, 30 days. Everyone else gets away with fines, probations, and community service sentences, and all five fans are banned from attending Pistons games for life. The incident would emerge as a watershed moment. Ten years later, Men's Journal would title a commemorative article, How the Malice of the Palace Changed Basketball Forever, a sentiment widely echoed in the sports media. As Yago Colas puts it in a, with not a small amount of sarcasm in Ball Don't Lie, quote, the so-called malice of the palace became a popular touchstone a symbol for media commentators and league officials of the catastrophes to which, in effect, insufficiently regulated blackness could lead, end quote. These reactions to the malice fit seamlessly with a, the, an image of Detroit as a black and hence lawless city. Rush Limbaugh's commentary, as, as transcribed by Media Matters, is a particularly striking example. I don't think anybody ought to be surprised, folks. I really don't think anybody ought to be surprised. This is the hip hop culture on parade. This is gang behavior on parade minus the guns. That's the culture that the NBA has become. A caller chimes in. This is not a new thing with the Pistons fans. Limbo replies, I know. That's why I say call it New Fallujah, Michigan. In tones of a more refined and ambivalent distaste for the NBA's hip hop milieu, Harvey Arrington commented in the New York Times that the brief brawl had been, quote, the most frightening eruption of sustained violence in an American sports arena, end quote. 
while Arrington is clearly and explicitly aware of the double standard for NBA players that made, quote, race the elephant in the arena, end quote, he nonetheless sees fit to claim that, quote, the sight of large black men rushing off the bench to throw punches at one another tended to evoke outcries in the media and from fans about the end of sports civilization as we know it, end quote. This is a baffling misrepresentation of the actual events, given that large black men rushed off the benches to contain the fight. And of course, such narratives erase the fact that not a single one of the Pistons fans involved was black. A chain of associations in play in much of contemporary coverage that links the blackness of the NBA to the blackness of Detroit, even though the game was played in White Auburn Hills, a city in Oakland County, and Ron Artest, the man who rushed the stands and would later take the name Metal World Peace, played for the Pacers, not the Pistons. The fascination with the malice drowned out all that went well for the Pistons that year, setting them apart from less than stellar seasons in the city's other sports. The 2003 Tigers had produced the worst performance in the history of the American League and had come within one loss of the worst ever season in Major League Baseball. The Tigers were slightly better in 2004, but still produced a losing season. The Lions were not quite as epically terrible in 2003 and 4 as they would be in 2008, but they still managed to win 11, only 11 out of 32 games over the two seasons. The Red Wings had dominated the regular season in 0304, but flamed out to Calgary in the conference semi-final. The 0304 Pistons, however, got the job done. They not only beat the Pacers in the conference finals, but against all odds, defeated the Lakers to become NBA champions for only the third time in franchise history. 2004 was a great year for the Detroit Pistons. That year's team was the creation of Joe Dumas, one of the all-time greats who played for the Pistons between 85 and 99. He was appointed general manager in 2000 and set about building a team he liked to call the Going to Work Pistons a tagline that turned into a marketing slogan over the years. This is how the Detroit Free Press portrayed the new image. Quote, hardworking guys, no whiners, no knuckleheads, but going to work is also a calculated articulation of that persona, an ethic that permeates the Pistons organization from the work shirts worn by the Palace staff to the perk cards, stands for Palace Employees Really Care, issued to Palace workers caught in the act of doing good deeds for customers, end quote. Going to work is how Detroiters see themselves, no matter what the rest of the world thinks. They are proud of their auto industry heritage and the hard backbreaking work that built it. It's a feeling that crosses the racial divide, not least because the industry's work workforce always included a large percentage of African Americans. From its earliest days, Black Americans could get work in car plants, not perhaps needless to say on an equal footing with white workers, but often enough union jobs that pay decent wages. They were routinely allocated the hardest, most dangerous jobs, such as foundry work where massive forges pressing hot metal made for often lethal working conditions. And pay rates for black workers were usually amongst the lowest in the industry. But even in the face of these discriminations, making cars was the shared work of the Motor City and a source of shared pride. The going to work pistons shared that pride, which stood in stark contrast to the national image of a crumbling, dangerous, abandoned Detroit as foreigners for Luger and hardly worked daily. That's it. Oh, you're muted, Bill Zucker. Seriously, after half a year. It's this is very embarrassing. Sorry about that. So I was saying that um, the story of Joe Lewis um, is pieced together from from um, separate chapters. He's uh, he's very central to our book. Uh, he's the only figure who has more than one chapter because um, so much of what he did and what was done to him was emblematic of not only black athletes life, but also deeply connected to Detroit. Um, so this, this one story you will hear a lot if you look up Joe Lewis or if you go to sports sites is that he was the first African-American hero, the first black man embraced by, by white America. That, that story has its root in, a, in the 1938 fight against Max Schmeling, um, the Hitler regime's most prominent boxer. 
uh, Lewis had lost to him in, in 36, but in 38, he knocked him out in two minutes and four seconds. Um, it was the fight of the century. The entire world was watching. It was a really big deal. It was a global a sports event. And please, nobody text me um, while I'm reading because I don't know how to turn my text sound off. Um, so I'm going to read excerpts in three acts. Joe Lewis becoming a hero to Black America, Joe Lewis moment as an all-American hero, and the betrayal of Joe Lewis. So one, what was unusual about Joe Lewis' career was not its end, but what it had meant. When he left the ring for good, his status surpassed that of any boxer who had come before him. Not only did he hold the championship for 12 years, longer than any heavyweight before or since, Klitschko, we can talk about that. Um, he had become a national icon, quote, the first universally embraced black American hero. Under the stress of national emergency for a brief period, Howard Bryant writes, Joe Lewis succeeded in erasing the color line. Lewis turned professional in 1934. He quickly rose to national prominence um, with 19 fights and 19 victories in under a year, including seven knockouts and only four fights that had to go the distance. In 35, this record won him a fight against the former champion Primo Canera at Yankee Stadium. Canera was associated with Benito Mussolini, the, the fascist dictator. And like the Schmeling fights to come, this fight was framed in racial terms throughout the press. At the time, Mussolini was threatening to evade Abyssinia, um, whose king, Haile Selassie, was a hero to uh, much of America's black population. Um, Lewis took, took care of Canera. He, he turned his face into a bloody mess and, and um, knocked him down three times in the sixth round, um, which ended the fight. Celebrations erupted in Harlem and nationwide um, of African Americans at a new hero. Maya Angelou in, um, has a very moving account of what it meant to listen to that fight on the radio. And I'm going to read a little excerpt from I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, where she talks about this. So, first, this radio quote He's got Lewis against the ropes. It's a left to the body, right to the ribs. Now, the right to the body looks like it was low. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the referee is signaling the contender keeps raining blows on Lewis. It's another to the body. It looks like Lewis is going down. My race groaned. It was our people falling. It was another lynching, another black man hanging on a tree, one more woman ambushed and raped, a black boy whipped and maimed. It was hounds on the trail of a man running through slimy swamps. It was a white woman slapping her maid for being forgetful. The men in the store stood away from the walls and at attention. Women greedily clutched the babes on their laps while on the porch the shufflings and smiles, flirtings and pinchings were gone. This might be the end of the world. If Joe lost, we were back in slavery and beyond help." End, uh, end quote. Such were the stakes in no small part because white America had made them the stakes. Angelou describes how this works, how sports and race become entangled, how entire worldviews enter the ring alongside the fighters. After describing the moment Lewis beats Canera and when it's over, she writes, champion of the world, a black boy, some black mother's son. He was the strongest man in the world. It would take an hour or more before the people would leave the store and head for home. Those who lived too far had made arrangements to stay in town. It would not be fit for a black man and his family to be caught on a lonely country road on a night when Joe Lewis had proved that we were the strongest people in the world. Now, Angelou, is, she's representative of, of a lot of um, accounts from this time. Um, there are very similar testimonies from Langston Hughes and from Lena Horne. And there are dozens of blues lyrics devoted to Lewis. Um, but after the second Schmeling fight, um, he became uh, an All-American figure for a while. So I read on. After the fight, Schmeling was rushed to the hospital and African Americans across the country partied through the night. In Harlem, it was said half a million people flowed into the streets. And ecstatic crowds were celebrating in Washington and Philadelphia, Chicago and Chattanooga, Milwaukee and Memphis, Cleveland and St. Louis. The Detroit Free Press reported that 10,000 people danced in the streets of Black Bottom while Cecil Lee's band played flat foot flugie with the floor floor. Similar scenes played out across America. David Margolik reports, 
from the fight itself. In the stands, there was bedlam. Talula Bankhead sprang to her feet and turned to the shmailing fence behind her. I told you so, you sons of bitches, she screamed. Whites were hugging blacks. The happiest people I saw at this fight were not Negroes, but the Jews, a black writer observed. Beat the hell out of the German bastard, W.E. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, lifelong Germanophile, who rarely swore, shouted gleefully in Atlanta. In Hollywood, Betty Davis jumped up and down. She had won $66 in the Warner Brothers fight pool. Everybody danced and sang, Woody Guthrie wrote from Santa Fe. I watched the people laugh, walk, sing, do all sorts of dances. I heard hooray for Joe Lewis and to hell with Max Schmeling in Indian, Mexican, Spanish, all kinds of white tongues. So this was a fight fa framed as a fight between white and black, between Nazi Germany and pluralist, big asterisk America, however egregiously the United States fell short. Germany had just annexed Austria. The entire world was watching and they were watching not just an American fight a German, they were watching a black man, man fight a white man with the stakes impossibly high. And even though this was in the end a fight between two different systems of white supremacy, for the first time, most of America was rooting for a black man. Quote, the whole damn country was depending on me, Lewis is quoted in a biography. So Joe Lewis was now a national treasure and he would remain one as long as he did not try to leverage his fame on behalf of racial justice with too much vigor. As the world slid towards war, Americans realized they would have to take sides. And even those who didn't care about politics recognized the greatest heavyweight boxer the world had ever seen. His nicknames, the Brown Bomber, the Dark Destroyer were respectful. But even as he became the nation's champion, nobody should be under any illusions. Joe Lewis' victory did not make a dent when it came to the racist discourse of the day. The Washington Post had this to say, quote, Joe Lewis, the lethargic, chicken-eating, young colored boy reverted to his dreaded role of the brown bomber. UPI, the news agency called him, quote, a jungle man, completely primitive as any savage, out to destroy the thing he hates, quote end. Joe Lewis was good enough to beat a Nazi to pulp. He was good enough to recruit black soldiers to the war as he did later. He was good enough to make people buy war bonds. He was not good enough to eat with white officers in the mess. In the end, America Act Three did not forgive Joe Lewis for forcing the country to root for him. In 1948, Lewis, $500,000 in debt to the IRS, and that included taxes on money he had donated to the Navy. Uh, he wanted to acquire a Ford dealership in Chicago. He wanted a middle-class all-American career, right? Selling the same cars he had helped build in the 30s when he had worked at the River Rouge factory. Henry Ford II asked for feedback from his dealers and regional managers, and 35 pages of that correspondence are preserved. The letters are a shocking read. District manager Johnson reports that, quote, we feel certain we would lose all of the state of South Carolina's business which would involve over 400 units a year in normal times. And that, quote, many present good Ford owners would never buy another Ford product. Houston weighs in, believes Ford Motor Company would be boycotted in the South. Indianapolis worries that, quote, whispering campaign might be started by competition. Pennsylvania is, quote, bluntly told that this would be construed as supporting Harry Truman and the other left wing groups in an election year would definitely give us bad public reaction. Some of the letters have a smidgen of bad conscience. Dearborn's district manager writes, if on the other hand, other factors should be given consideration such as human relations, constitutional rights or some such factors, we would probably have to change our decision. Others don't even try. Alabama's Mr. Lloyd strongly recommended that regardless of any circumstances, we do not appoint Joe Lewis or any other Negro as a Ford dealer anywhere in the United States and that we keep the Ford business a white man's business. New Orleans, Ford's business is a white man's business. We do not want any Negroes in it. So whether it was because Ford would lose business in the South or because appointing a single black dealership would signal Ford's alliance with communists of left wings, or because respectable white dealers from the South would refuse to attend conferences, or because the competition would exploit it, or because Ford would be seen to side with Harry Truman and the civil rights legislation that was beginning its long march through Congress. One thing was clear, Ford could employ African-Americans, but it certainly could not allow them to become employers.
in turn. If the first black American hero was going to find the money to pay his taxes, he had to return to the ring. And he did for four more years. So how does it end? While Joe Lewis may not sell Fords, Max Schmeling, the Nazi's icon, gets rich uh, selling soda, Coca-Cola no less, that most quintessential American drink. In the 1950s, Schmeling gains the exclusive rights to bottle and distribute Coke in Hamburg, very lucrative career move. In the meantime, Joe Lewis tours with the Daily Brothers Circus as one of its attractions. In the 60s, he's mocked as an Uncle Tom by some members of an African-American community, increasingly less impressed by the respectability politics that had allowed Lewis to become a hero. His health deteriorates, he takes drugs, he has paranoid episodes, his money is gone, he rides a scooter to get around, he works as a greeter in Las Vegas at Caesar's Palace. He dies in April of 1981. Max Schmeling is one of his pallbearers and pays for some of the funeral expenses. He will outlive Joe Lewis by 24 years. Thank you. Thank you, Soka and Stefan, for those uh, readings. And those uh, two stories that you shared, one in the year 20, 2004, other over several decades, uh, are sports stories. And in the process, they tell us uh, much about the larger society. So they tell a range of other stories. So I'd like to begin with asking you to share with us the story of the book itself in two ways. How did you come to conceive of this, this wonderful, wonderful book? And how did you put it together in terms of the, how did you uh, decide on and arrange the stories that make up the book? So um, I guess in some ways, Suzuka has been in, in Michigan and Arbor for a lot longer than, than I have. So I came, I'm a relatively recent arrival and I, I became fascinated with it, um, particularly through actually something we have mentioned here, the, the history of Detroit's attempts to bring the Olympic Games to the city, which is something people often don't know this um, uh, Detroit attempted to win the Olympic Games from the 1930s right up to the 1970s uh, and made very serious attempts, was the official uh, bidder on behalf of the U.S. Olympic Committee throughout those years and I think and came very close at, on at least two occasions to being successful. And all of that material is contained in an archive in Detroit Public Library, which is something I learned about uh, after being here for a few years and it's sort of became more and more interested in understanding how this fitted in with the history of the city. And I started teaching this and um, became uh, teaching about Detroit and the Olympics and also teaching about thinking about how Detroit as a sports city, which it is one of the most storied sports cities in, in the United States, how that fitted in um, with, uh, with, with the history of, um, at, uh, of how the history of the sports and how the history of the city interconnected. And really then, well, how did I persuade you, Zoka, to become interested in this? I, what was the... I, I had long been fascinated by the city of Detroit and started to, to really feel it's, I think, very compelling pull it's very hard to describe if you don't know Detroit, right? And the, the national discourse, of course, has always focused on, oh, ruination, bankruptcy, um, and, and, and murderers, and so on and so on. And um, over the last 10 years, I started going to Detroit more and more often um, and broadened where in Detroit I would go, right? More and more from the, like the usual, oh, Selden Standard or concert, um, to more and more neighborhoods. And then uh, Steph and I actually spent a summer there. We rented a place in, in two different neighborhoods um, and became deeper and deeper fascinated by the city. Now, as I told Stephen yesterday, I really don't give a damn about sports. Um, I, I, I don't know what or why one does things with a ball. Um, I'm very bad at throwing, kicking or hitting things other than uh, those who have it coming. And, um, but 
as Stefan started talking about the stories around the sports, I became completely hooked. And as a, as a humanist, it seems to me that sports is really, it's the global culture, right? It's, it's the, um, it's the story and metaphor generator of our time globally. And I think as humanists, we really can't, um, can't afford to not get interested in these stories, even if we don't care about the most narrow aspect of sports itself, right? And as Stefan says, Detroit is a sports city, right? You go downtown, you can, you stand in the right spot, you can spit on four stadiums, right? Um, that, is, that is fairly unusual. And so once I started reading up on Joe Lewis, I became completely hooked. And so we wrote that thing together and it was great. Um, it was a great experience. Now, as we've already, you've both referenced and we've all heard this, the book is made up of many stories uh, spanning a wide range of time. Tell us about how, um, how you arrange them, please. Ah. The organization of the book um, and how it can expand our, our historical imagination. So, uh, what, so I think, the, well, the, the, the key fact is we tell the, the story going historically back in time. So we start with the most recent events historically and we end the book with a sporting event from 1763. So now that uh, to a historian probably seems very strange and weird, but there, there are really two big advantages to this. So firstly, I mean, in general, Although historians tell stories from the past and in a linear fashion up to the present, archaeologists excavate sites starting from the recent history and going down yeah. deeper. And there is something about the way archaeologists uh, understand the world that I think is, can also help in thinking about history as well. But I think that, that's a sort of an abstract view in, in general, but I think there's something very specific about Detroit. And I, this, based on my experience of teaching this to students, the, there's often a presumption that somehow what happened to Detroit was inevitable, that it's a series of logical steps that inexorably culminated in disaster. And okay, people now talk about recovery, but um, still people are fixated on the problems that Detroit, that affected Detroit. And one thing is by, by breaking that, you know, uh, progressive linear um, kind of inverted weak theory of history, actually it helps you get away from that focus and saying, well, these are events that happened in, in, in these, are, these are stories from points in history where nobody knew what necessarily what was gonna happen next. And where everybody would probably live with great hope and expectation of a brighter future and a better future. And who knows, for many reasons, maybe there could have been a, a, a different path and perhaps a better path than the one that was that was what, what actually came to pass. So I think a very good example is um, the story of the bid for the for the 1968 Olympic Games which took place in 1963 and where Detroit really came extraordinarily close to, to winning the, the, the right to host the 68 games. And you cannot say that the events of 67 would not have happened. There wouldn't have been an uprising, but you can, I think for sure say the uprising if there had taken place would have been a very different event. And that perhaps it is conceivable that maybe events could have taken a completely different path if in 67 Detroit had been about to host the Olympic Games. So one thing I think is the way we structure the book helps to maybe think about some of these issues and, and, to, and look at Detroit through perhaps a lens um, from the past, which is perhaps gives you a, a different understanding. And one of the things that I think that does is, which is very important for underst contemporary understandings of Detroit and its past is that disrupts a familiar, even standard narrative of a, of a rise and fall of Detroit's rapid and, and a dramatic rise during the first half of the 20th century and the equally dramatic and a devastating fall in the second half of the 20th century, more or less. And so that narrative is very familiar, frequently used and, and used to explain the present and make predictions about the future of the city. 
but it's flawed in many ways. And the way that the two of you approach um, your subject matter, the way that you arrange the book helps to d disrupt that. That I think that is that is very much part of the um, intention. I'm I'm sure we're guilty of using the rise and fall trope uh, once or twice in the in the book because it's a it's, it's a very dominant trope in it, right? But I think if you actually look at the moments that are meant to be the rise, the golden years of Detroit, and you look at what all was happening and how Detroit was structured and to whose benefit it was structured and to whose benefit it was very much not structured, the idea of the golden years of Detroit becomes a lot more complicated. Yes, there were economic times of economic upturn, but they came at tremendous costs, right? And the other problem with the rise and fall thing is of course, is that it, in the public imagination, the national imagination of Detroit, it tracks very closely to the blacker Detroit becomes, the more the downfall happens. And then somewhere in the early 21st century, the white billionaires come in and pull downtown and midtown back out of the muck. And of course that is an incredibly um, problematic um, storyline which we're trying to kind of push back in all kinds of details against that story right that um, I hope with some success right um, yeah the the many stories that you tell help to to do the disaggregating that is required yeah. to do that and, yeah. and to um, to puncture the, the, the tight uh, structure of the rise and fall narrative and, and as you referenced so the rise and fall narrative is very much a story of 20th century Detroit Mm -hmm. but as you as you reference, there's a a, a re rise kind of third part addendum to it, which is a part of the 21st story, 21st century story, pinned to uh, white billionaires and uh, uh, white hipsters, or, or and, and so forth. And so that brings me to a, the next question I'd like to ask you, which is a question of ownership, huh. something which which you referenced in your reading from the introduction, Soka, mm -hmm. um, one dimension of it. So the question is this: what does your book tell us what have you learned and what are your thoughts about different conceptualizations of ownership? Ownership, for instance, of, of sports teams. As you referenced that there are owners of teams, but other we may see others, the city itself or particular populations claiming ownership. Ownership to the stories, to the narratives about those teams. Um, ownership in multiple ways. Yeah. I, th I think it's a, it's a crucial question of Detroit, right? Who, who does Detroit belong to or the different parts But Detroit is, I mean, it's a vast city, right? And it has vastly different parts to it. It's one, I mean, just the area, right? It's like 130 square miles. And most people talk about the 7.2 square miles that's downtown and midtown, right? Um, but specifically with regard to sports teams, and I'll let Stefan talk more about it. He's the economist in the family, right? Um, what has always freaked me out as a, as a European where sports are, are organized a little bit differently is this very discourse of the owner of sports teams, which then gets kind of even more creepy when sports are dominated by um, black athletes, right? And then the word owner itself kind of makes your skin crawl. And the fact that if a team wins a trophy, that this trophy is being given to this owner who did not kick any balls and who did not, you know, score any goals is completely scandalous to me, right? Um, in, in Europe, it would go to the team captain, which seems um, a bit more sensible. That That is a somewhat a shallow answer to your question, because, um, but I, I will hand over to The Economist to talk <laughs> more about who owns what and the complications of um, the the saviors, right? Uh, the, the owners of downtown Detroit, Dan Gilbert and uh, the Illiches, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, one of the important thing is, again, I think that's part of the, us being both Europeans is we come at this, we think of team ownership in differently and where, where we come from, um, uh, sports organizations are community assets. They belong to the community and woe betide an owner who gets over his skates and starts to act like you know he's in control of this the fans soon bring you down to earth and i think you know and and in, in many ways that's true in in america as well in the sense that people believe in there is a community dimension to this and um i mean one of the stories we uh we talk about is 
um, when the Pistons moved out of the city um, and um, Mayor Coleman tried his damnedest to, to keep them in the city because he saw it as being um, so much, um, Coleman Young saw it as being so crucial to, um, to the identity of the city. So it, it's there, the, the, the problem is that the, the way the capitalist system works is that in at least the way it works in America is that there's, there's nothing the fans can do. They are out, it's out of their control and there's nothing the, um, the, the, the mayor can do. And in some ways we've seen this with, you know, the, in some ways there's a, we draw a parallel between this and the car industry where as, as the city was struggling, the car industry demanded more and more subsidies as a, as a ransom to stay in Detroit and eventually left Detroit anyway to, to a large extent. Um, and we've seen the same with sports arenas. We see the way, the way in which the, 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 the Pistons and the Red Wings were, or the Red Wings stayed downtown and the, and the Pistons were brought back downtown was really by a, a form of bribery because you have the, the owners, the, the ultimate gods who must be placated at all costs. And in some sense that encapsulates some of the problems of the city and, and it, some of the issues that it, there's an asymmetry, there's a power asymmetry in terms of um, uh, the way the city is, is run and um, Hopefully that's something that can be addressed in the future because it's it certainly it, it ha Detroit is not the only city which you can think of in these terms. There are lots of cities that have struggled precisely because of these kinds of power asymmetries. So, and those power asymmetries uh, unfold in many manifold ways. So uh, let's now ask John to uh, to turn us to Q and A. And as we do, let me just offer this. Uh, Zilka, as you, you threw the question of ownership to the economist, um, but with all due respect to him and his guild, I would like to submit that the question of ownership can be as much about text, images, and narrative, I the, work of, the work of humanists, as it is of economic considerations and financial machinations. I completely well, agree. It's a long conversation I'd love to, I'd love to have with... Um, you, Stephen, and Stefan, and, and anybody else who wants to join. Thank you. Well, let's see if John can start to get us there now. <laughs> yeah, there's some questions that I touch on some things that you're talking about. Um, in fact, our first question, Stefan, touches on something directly that you were discussing. Um, a viewer writes in from Flint. Um, As a person who moved to Michigan later in life, I'm interested in your insights concerning the geography of sports teams in Detroit, for example, and never understood why the Pistons played in Auburn Hill. So you touched a bit on this, these moves, of course, um, for a long time, um, the Pistons played in Auburn Hills, the Lions uh, played in the Silver Dome in Pontiac. It's only very recently that um, the, now with the sort of Gilbert Plex of Little Caesars, uh, all of the major sports teams in Detroit play uh, in Metropolitan, in downtown Metropolitan Detroit. The Pizza Arena. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and and we have we have two or three chapters in the book that deal precisely with this. So, so firstly, the move of the Lions to Pontiac, um, who were they were playing uh, in the old Tiger Stadium up until the time that they moved to Pontiac in the early seventies, and um, it's it's a strange story because Henry Ford the second was. Uh, organizing the construction of the Rensen just at the time that that move was taking place. And many people wanted there to be a downtown stadium in, uh, uh, on the waterfront. And had that happened, it co probably could have done a lot to preserve the downtown and, and would have done a lot for the city. But Henry Ford II and his brother couldn't agree and this is again, this is a problem of ownership. These two, these two guys seem to have hated each other. And so uh, William Clay Ford took his team to Pontiac almost as a, it seems almost as like a, a protest. And then um, Bill Davidson, the owner of the Pistons uh, really couldn't get on with Mayor Coleman Young. They, they hated each other. 
And that's a large part of why he took his team to, to, to Pontiac and then ultimately to Auburn Hills. So, I, I mean, it's a great point and why these, these peripatetic teams um, cause, uh, really leave a trail of destruction behind them and a, a trail of broken hearts, really, because, you know, the fans lose out when, when these things happen. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's very tough. And I think, you know, I, I think that's a real problem. The next question, um, could you speak a little to the role of the Detroit Football Club in the makeup of this team's fans um, and the recent, in quotes, comeback um, of white, De- white Detroit, which I think perhaps alludes to both the um, sort of uh, the way that Campus Marsh's area has sort of been t- turned into sort of a shopping area and sort of bougie food place and then uh, i think perhaps a, a bit of the but gentrification this, in corktown as well but there's a question about dcfc if i understand correctly yes yes yeah uh, but uh, yeah and i think much not that. i see i see it's, oh, it's about that as well yeah yeah right. so i mean we, we are both pretty avid dcfc fans and uh, have have season tickets um to their games and in part i think we are we are partial to dcfc precisely because it tries to be a community club not an owner club, right? Um, it's it's organized. We're, are we shareholders? I think I'm a shareholder in any case. Um, and the DCFC games are kind of community festivals. And again, I don't go for the ball game. Their, their, their soccer is really not quite up to what I'm used to from my German upbringing quite yet. Um, but um, the atmosphere in the stands is completely fantastic. Also their margaritas, their slows barbecue. Um, so the makeup of the fans is, um, I think it's shifting a little bit. It's a, it's a pretty white crowd, I think in part because um, soccer is a pretty white sport still in the, in the US, right? Um, a bit like hockey is, is still um, by and large, a white sport, but they're trying very hard to um, to build very strong ties into the community. Um, they have a lot of um, Middle Eastern fans. They have a lot of Hispanic fans. So it is a, um, I think, a very kind of interesting way to reimagine sports for the city of Detroit, and it, it seems uh, new. And they have the most loyal fan base you have ever. Um, imagine they come with these huge steam machines there's an entire liturgy for the game like which um, dirty song you sing at what minute of the game how you taunt the enemy and so on and so on so um, yeah it's a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk for the the humanists um, a a complete work of art speaking to all the senses but um, I don't know whether that's what Rebecca was um, was after it's so hard not to see the people you're talking to in the questions um, May I offer two quick points? Yeah. It was quite appropriate that, that John would use the word bougie in referring to a question from Rebecca. And so I'll leave it at that unless <laughs> so, so, someone wants to. Not that Rebecca is bougie. Rebecca has, Rebecca's bougie crap is a great explication of some of the dynamics, not dealing with sports, but dealing with the uh, comeback of Detroit. Secondly, okay. I, uh, I, I, made a joke at the expense of Stefan and the dismal science. So now I'm going to make a, a joke at the expense of Silka and say, challenge her earlier comment where she said, quote, I really don't give a damn about sports. Close <laughs> and I would like to submit that what we just heard her say suggests otherwise. The way she spoke about DCFC and the, the, the soccer not being up to par to her origins. <laughs> All right, I, fair, fair point. I do make an exception for soccer. That's <laughs> the only sport I understand. Um. <laughs> but yes, fair point. Um, we've we've got one more question, and it, and it makes reference to um, my favorite basketball player of all time and my favorite quote of all time. Um, Rashid Wallace used to say, "Ball don't lie," uh, a nice metaphor, I think. Do you think that sports, with all the fandom, institutions, economics, and so on around it, provides perhaps the best prism for the social in our culture? And if so, how? That's a really great question. And again, I, I, you know, with my economist hat, hat on, I mean, I've made a research career out of studying sports, but that's largely because everything in sports 
happens out in the open. Mm -hmm. I can measure how good you are. I can I can count how many goals you scored, how many baskets, how many shots you, what your field goal percentage is, how many yards you won, all of these, how many home runs you've hit, everything. I, I can do all of that. And I can correlate that. I can find out how much you earn, actually, as a player. And I can correlate that perfectly. And I can I can figure out what somebody is worth, at least in a sense, in at least in a relative sense. I know where the players stand relative to each other. That's not to say, okay, we can have this argument about whether players are worth all of this money, but I can tell you how much more LeBron is worth than the next best player, right? That and that that openness is really, really important. And that's one of the reasons why sport, I think, has been the way in which in many cases, um, people from coming from backgrounds where they're suffering prejudice and they're suffering discrimination, they're able to break out because bull don't lie. That's, that's, it's a great quote and it's a great way of thinking about that. And the problem I think is that, that and, and although in many ways sports mirrors society, this is one area I think where it's less, the connection is less clear. Because I think part of the problem with the rest of society is that it's less clear, it's less observable how good people are. It's, it's in some sense there's less transparency. In some sense, it means there's less less justice and rationale in the way in which people get rewarded. So it's easier to pass down privilege when nobody's watching and can check what's really going on. Much harder to pass down privilege. I don't care how good LeBron's son is if he's not really up to it on the court, he ain't going to make the same money. But I think, I mean, sports is also, I mean, it is it's a kind of a stellvertreter. God, how do you say that? I mean, it, it fills a lot of vicarious roles, right? It, it creates community um, in the absence of maybe other structures that used to create community, right? Um, but it also arouses these insane insane violent passions that are simply not to have no rational basis in the act of playing with balls itself right um i mean that is fun and enjoyable i get that for people who like that kind of thing but there's no reason to kill somebody because they're rooting for another team there's no reason to stab a soccer player in the heart for missing a penalty kick right there's no reason to set um, cars on fire because your team lost or won. It doesn't matter, right? I mean, if you look at Philadelphia with the Eagles win or lose, it's always the exact same kind of celebration, right? So, I mean, sports also these catalysts, I think, for, for, communal, for communal events, both friendly and hostile ones, um, which I think makes them very deserving of our attention. But beyond so economics. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think that's absolutely right. I mean, that that the, you know, uh, I mean, it is. I mean, you say there's no reason for these passions. I mean, that's the whole point about passion is there's no reason, right? Um, and and I think that's that's the the whole story here is that this that sports reach down deep into us, and we identify deeply with them, and so they are a good way of understanding the social environments in which we live and you know sports and sports are tied to cities right so that's i mean this is also why sport yeah. is political Poli cities are political sports are political these things are all tied together so although there's economics in it i mean it's not it's never just the economics it's always part of a broader set of social structures and the economics just is you know some part of the, yeah. you know, the, the scaffolding around which it's all arranged right ask us more questions Oh, it's awesome. well, I don't know. I don't know if John wants to. Um, may, may I follow up with that quickly, John? This is either for you, John, or you, Stefan. The question asked is about this quote, the statement from Rashid Wallace. But what more should we say about Rashid Wallace? He actually was instrumental to the to the story that Stefan read earlier, and, and who he is. And, and John, you said he's your favorite player, right? So this is also an invitation to you. Yeah. Well, I just um, I was just thinking how the the o three o four. Pistons are the probably the only team I could NBA team I could probably name the starting mm -hmm. five for, um, and I was uh, my family's from Detroit and I grew up in in Iowa so ah. any 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 ability to sort of glom on to 
this sort of like home that I didn't have anymore or whatever to like, I don't know, be contrarian as well was very exciting. And so when the Pistons were making that finals run, but yeah, to, 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 for those who don't know, the ball don't lie quote is um, um, a foul was called. I don't know if it was on Rashid or one of his teammates. Um, and so someone else went to the line for, for, um, for free throws and um, right before uh, after missing the first one, Rashid said, ball, don't lie. Meaning that the ball is imbued with the truth. And so if you've, you've got a cheap foul, um, ball's not going to go in the basket um, and, 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 you know, countenance your BS foul. Um, but yeah, he was also an instrumental player on that championship team um, and became, I don't know, just sort of like a beloved sports figure, um, among beloved sports figures um, in Detroit. And then I think he went on to have a pretty long career after leaving the Pistons. Um, but also just to the question as well, I think the, um, at least for your book, it seems like that the viewing sports is a way to look at Detroit simply because the moves of Stadia, as you've discussed, have economic um, um, motivations. They may have cultural, racial motivations as well. Yeah. Um and so much of the way why the malice story is, is, is so important because it, it was a similar kind of pivotal moment for those things and allowed people to use i guess detroit sometimes it's, i think unjustly done to sort of frame some sort of strange series of political points that they might want to make yeah. um but as well um yeah i don't i don't know i, I think it's 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 interesting to me to think about viewing Detroit through sports as a means to sort of understanding not just Detroit, but as Stefan is saying, there's, there are other cities for which these things that we sort of keep in the realm of sports, especially like stadium construction and stuff like that. And teams moving have these seriously redounding, not just economic, but sort of social um, effects, usually ill effects. Um I, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, we, we are at the top of the hour, but if there's anything else, Stephen, that you wanted to ask or any, any final points we wanted to make before closing, yeah. I'd, I'd be happy to hear that. We can also just, just give a shout out to Yoga Kolas' book, which is called Bulldog Lie, which is a very fine text to read about, again, thinking about the cultural meaning of basketball in American society. It's, uh, uh, so um, after you bought our book, please, uh, please buy Yoga's book as well. He actually has a, in fact, come think of it, he has actually a new book out, which is also extremely interesting about trying to understand why people are interested in why sports statistics play such a role in people's lives and how, what, what that really means, the, the obsession with sports statistics. And it's, it's a, that's also a very fine one. The quantification, right? You want to see why are people so into sports quantification? So his first book was about the, the passion and race and cultural meaning. And then the second book now is about why are you all counting? Uh, it's um, very interesting. Because I do a lot of counting. I really like the book. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank everybody for hanging out with us. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I, I, I find it hard not to see people who are here. It feels very odd, but I know you are. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. It's been, it's been yeah. Fun great have a chance to talk about the book and thanks to Stephen for for agreeing to moderate and to john of course for and literati yeah. um buy all your books from literati they will send them to you yes buy your books from literati and maybe Stephen, there's a chance for you to say a word or two about um the semester in detroit that you run which again enables you then students to get more involved with the city uh, thank you Stephen. Yes, the uh, U of M Semester in Detroit program is a program for undergraduate students to spend a semester living in the city, taking classes there and doing internships for which they receive course credit in non nonprofit organizations and other community-based uh, spaces. And we also have a, um, a speaker series called uh, Detroit to Speak, which we're doing, we'll be beginning next week in combination, in collaboration with African American Studies Department at Wayne State University and the General Baker Institute. Um, and General Baker, by the way, and his organization, Uhuru, uh, make an appearance in this book in 1963. They're part of the story of 
um, one part of the one moment that Stefan referenced of the choice efforts to um, to garner the Summer Olympics. So please look for Semester in Detroit program and the speaker series, which is beginning next week, um, titled Policing Black Power from Watts to Detroit. Thank you, all of you who joined us. Thanks again to Stephen Ward and to Stefan Sismanski and Silka Maria Vinek. Um, you can purchase the book. There's a link in the in the chat, um, as mentioned. And um, we hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And we hope to see you at our next virtual event and um, back in our store as we work to reopen to in-person browsing. But until then, um, please take care. <laughs>